while I was preparing for this, I was reminded of a TV show I used to watch when I was growing up. And, and to be honest with you, it used to freak me out, okay? Um, because what, what would happen is I would be watching it. It came on at night. You know, some of y'all don't remember what it was. But they would always talk about, like, some criminal who did some heinous crime, and they were still on the loose. And couldn't nobody figure out who it was. See, automatically, I heard y'all. y'all. Y'all automatically starting to get what it was. And the worst part about it was you sitting there at night by yourself, right? And you just watching this show and the criminals still on the loose. They're still at large and you freaking out. Every noise I hear in the house, I'm thinking to myself, is that them? Right? And so I was super scared. If you haven't guessed it yet, it's Unsolved Mysteries. And I used to watch that show and they had the creepy music on in the background. And what used to freak you out is you didn't know if they caught the person or not. Were they around the corner from your house? Were they coming for you next? You know what I'm saying? And then every now and then, y'all remember they used to have an update. Y'all remember the updates? And it, would, and it would pop up and the music would change. It would get all intense and they'd say the criminal has been apprehended. And then all of a sudden it gave you a little sense of peace. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Because this psychopath has been put in chains. And so it gave you a, a sense of comfort that the mystery was solved. Well, today we're going to talk about unsolved mysteries. Daniel 2, and we're going to read throughout Daniel 2, so we're kind of going backwards within the series, but I think there's something very unique uh, that's going to be pointed out to us today. And uh, we're going to start at verse 1 through 3, and then we're going to skip through uh, some of the passages. It says, One night during the second year of his reign, Nebuchadnezzar had such disturbing dreams that he couldn't sleep. Okay, an unsolved mystery. He called in his magicians, enchanters, sorcerers, and astrologers, and he demanded that they tell him what he had dreamed. As they stood before the king, he said, I have had a dream that deeply troubles me, and I must know what it means. Okay, so he's freaking out like us when we was watching Unsolved Mysteries, and we, don't, we can't figure out if they solved the crime or not. They said again, please, your majesty, tell us the dream, and we will tell you what it means. He said, if you don't tell me the dream, you are doomed. So you have conspired to tell me lies, hoping I will change my mind. But tell me the dream, and then I'll know that you can tell me what it means. The king was furious when he heard this, and he ordered that all the wise men of Babylon be executed. Okay? Then Daniel went home and told his friends, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, which you all may know as Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, but their Hebrew names were these. They told him what happened. So he and his prayer partners got together. And he urged them to ask the God of heaven to show them his mercy by telling them the secret so that they would not be executed along with the other wise men of Babylon. That night, the secret was revealed to Daniel in a vision. Then Daniel praised the God of heaven. Okay, we're going to bring Babylon to right now, 2021. And when in this passage, it particularly says that the king went to his magicians, astrologers and, and all the rest of that. What that really represents in our day was his cabinet. This, this, these were civil workers that were working for the king, and to the best methods of their day, they were trying to figure out how to discern what to advise the king so that their people can perpetually be, be, be blessed. That was the point of what their role was. They meant well. And here's the thing about Babylon. It was a wealthy kingdom. It was the wealthiest, most influential kingdom of that day and time. So it experienced great success. It was, it was, it's, it's, it's claimed to be one of the greatest wonders of the world in what they were able to build and the amount of wealth that they were able to amass. And so for us in our day, we have artists, we have entertainers that are trying to express through their music and through their movies and through their paintings, they're trying to express and explore the pains, the joys, the beauty, the brokenness of our human condition. And then you have some scientists which are trying to figure out through their, through their methods, through their laboratories, where we come from, where are we headed, what are the best ways to fix some of the problems that are going on within this world. And then we have our philosophers, right? On college campuses, right? On, on TV shows, they're, they're pontificating. And they're trying to figure out how do we solve what we are and how do we fix some of the problems that we have within our families, within our culture, within society? And then you got the medical community. Lord Jesus, we got a pill for everything, right? If, if you got a problem, let's, let's figure out a pill to go to it. And how many of y'all are grateful for some of them pills? Don't be playing. 
We grateful for some of them pills. I thank God for prayer and Tylenol. Come on, somebody. So not all, but many of these fields, they have this problem. They have disassociated God within their practices. This is the issue. They, they have the intention of trying to make sense of our troubling times, but in order to solve the mysteries, they're missing the key ingredient to understand what's going on with the madness within our society, right? There, there's a common grace. I want y'all to hear this. There's a common grace given by God to every person on the planet. Every person on the planet has a grace to do something good. So you might not be a believer, but that doesn't mean that everything you do is bad. Y'all get what I'm saying? There, there, are some, there are some people in this room who have had surgeries, and the person who did the surgery on you did not believe in your God. But thank God your elbow works. You get what I'm saying? There are some people in this room, you done got hip replacement, and you all patched up and made new. They weren't speaking in tongues while they was doing surgery on you. But thank God for the grace on their life and the gift that they had to contribute to your life. There are inventions that have made life better. And those inventions came because God enabled them to come up with things that made society better. Everybody got that? We thank God for advancements in the psychological field, the medical field, in the scientific community, in the educational field, in government. We thank God for good people who may not know God that have done some good things. But at the end of the day, in order for them to change fundamentally the problems that plague our society, they cannot unravel the mystery that leads to the devastation and the destruction that consistently comes throughout generation after generation. And that is that at the core of the human condition, it is not just that we need to be smarter or more technologically advanced. The issue is that if you have the best technology, but you have people with broken hearts who are in charge of them, they are still destructive. If you have the best medicine and the best education, but the people who are in charge of it have hearts that are corrupt, then at the end of the day, the systems will always fail to take us to the next level that we're trying to get to within society. Something has to happen within the human heart and then all of those other things begin to take us to greater levels that we all are aspiring to get to within society. There's a key that's required to unlock the mysteries that everybody's trying to solve. And that is a heart that puts God first. I know that seems so simple, but it's the first commandment. That we have no other God before him. That he is the one true and living God. And when we put God first, everything else falls in order. Proverbs 3 and 5, it says that if we acknowledge God, if we just acknowledge him, if we're aware of the fact that he is God and we seek him for the answers to our mysteries, he will direct our path. How many of y'all believe the word of God, right? Wisdom flows from worshiping Yahweh. Wisdom flows as we worship, as we worship Yahweh, our God, as we seek him, he begins to give us the solving of the mysteries, Worship is us saying to God, there's a creator who's ruling over his creation and he has a purpose and he has a plan that there is no other God, including myself, my own wisdom or the people I admire within society or the entertainers that I like or the people around me that have done some great things. My boss ain't my God. Amen. I have no other God, but one God. And that being said, if we come from him, then the closer that we get to beholding him, the more that we become like him. And the more that we become like him, the more that we love people. The more that we love people, the more it changes our principles. The more that our principles are changed because we love people, it changes the products we make. It changes the laws we implement. It changes how we go about debating and going through philosophy. It changes what we teach in our educational systems. It changes everything about how you practice medicine. Everything in your life, when it's rooted in the foundation of love, it changes how you then approach what you do within society. So the problem is we want people to change how they think about what they produce in whatever field they're in. 
But the issue is, why would you even have a need to if you don't think within your heart you're doing harm to other people? The issue about harm to other people is that you don't realize how far off you may be until you actually have a real definition of what love is. Love makes me, it compels me to do right by you according to what God says right is. I am obligated, I have a responsibility to treat you in a manner that God approves as worthy and not my own opinion. And so what we have within society is we have people who have become their own gods and they have determined their own truth and out of their own truth and their own worldview, what they consider to be loving acts are actually dangerous to other people around them. So until hearts change, there will be people who mean well, but they do harm. Our society's issues are opportunities to reveal Christ's compassion in culture. Snapshot that bad boy. Because this is the heart of the issue. This is the problem of what we have going on right now today. Our society's issues are opportunities to reveal Christ's compassion within culture. People are broken. They need the healer. And he lives in us. He lives in believers. You can either see Babylon as a prison to escape or a place full of people to engage. You, you can see your job as a place that you're trying to get rid of because you're tired of all the bad people on your job. Or you can see your job as a place God has strategically planted you so that you can show Christ's compassion within a corrupt culture. I, I can't tell you how many times I've talked to people who, who have told me, man, I want to get off my job. And I start talking to them about why. It ain't about this or, or the, the basic thing. Oh, man, it's just too many people around me who be cussing. I'm like, you can't handle cussing? Seriously? Well, I just don't like what they be talking about. What, what would you prefer to talk about? It, see, it's not the whole who need a physician, but the sick. What if we're praying to get out of the very place God planted us? See, light, light is most used, it's most impactful in the darkness. And the darker it is, the greater the need for the light. All right, let's go to the definition of mystery. Y'all good? Mystery, mystery, the definition of it. A secret with hidden meaning. Nebuchadnezzar had a secret that had a hidden meaning and he couldn't figure it out. In Latin, the word literally means secret worship. In other words, how to worship. It was hidden. They didn't understand how to worship. And so the people who had a connection, they had the heavenly hookup with God, they knew a secret that other people didn't know. How to acknowledge God and be changed by what you see. I'm going to say it again. How to acknowledge God and be changed by what you see. The other people just didn't know it. They knew there was some God, but they didn't know how to connect with him. You and I, we have the key to the mystery. We know how to worship. Let me make it clear. It's not that people want nothing to do with God. In fact, many people around us and some of the ones with the worst behavior that are around you and even in your family, they believe in a higher power. But the truth of the gospel has become mystery meat. Y'all know what mystery meat is. It's when you look at it and you know something was cooked, but you don't quite know what it is. And you have that moment where it's like, do I eat this? Because I am kind of hungry, but I don't know where that came from. Right. When, when a person is lost and, and we're trying to talk Bible. When a person has not um, been filled with the spirit of God and then they come in and they may sit in a service and we're talking about all our stories as if they know the stuff that we're talking about. It's mystery meat to them. It don't make sense. Right. It's mystery meat to them. It's just like the dream that troubled the king. God dropped a revelation that will change the course of human history. 
We know the end of time and how it's going to end because a dream that was given to a person who couldn't even understand it. And it wasn't until King Neb connected with Daniel and the boys that he was able to get a revelation of what it was that was troubling him within his heart. Can't we see that God could have just gave the dream, given the dream to Daniel? But it was that he wanted to tie in the most powerful king in the most powerful nation so that his heart could be changed. And he sent some random Hebrews who the king chose to serve within his civil government. And he partnered the two together. And it's in their collaboration that we have the book that we have called Daniel to this day. God didn't bypass a person who didn't know him because God is interested in those who are far from him. So listen, guys, what could the king do with what he couldn't understand? It was almost as if God set him up. He set him up with something that troubled him within his soul, just like the scientists, the philosophers, just like some of the atheists, just like the teachers on the school board, just like the superintendents, just like the mayor, just like the councils that we have all around us. People are trying to figure out how do we fix what's broken in our world? And the answer, simply put, for those of us who are on the other side of worship, that's no longer a secret to us. We like Jesus is the answer. And they looking at you like <laughs> mystery meat. The gospel is mystery meat without illumination and proper demonstration. And it's a combination of the two. They need illumination. They need believers who can give understanding as to the how of the gospel. And they also need a demonstration of how the gospel is lived out and how it transforms the life of a believer so that they can see the significance and the meaning and the impact behind it. I want you all church to release the light that is within you and be a shining example of Christ within culture. I want to give you the most practical example of this that we find within the New Testament. And I'm going to set it up for you real quick. But in Acts 17, Paul, the apostle, he goes and he's speaking to a group, group of people in the city of Athens. And as he is a Jewish man, he was going into the synagogue and they were having de re religious debates and they had heard about the stuff that Paul was talking and Paul was trying to reason with them and illuminate their understanding of the gospel. And then as he was doing it, he started walking through the streets and he saw some of the temples where they were worshiping false gods. And so he strikes up a conversation with them because the scriptures tell us in Acts 17 that he was bothered by their idolatry and their worship of all these other gods and their sinful lifestyle. So here's how Paul approached their idolatry and approached their unsolved mysteries uniquely. Listen to this. Acts 17 verse 19. Then they took him to the high council of the city. Come and tell us about this mystery meet, this new teaching. I'm sorry. So Paul, standing before the council, Daniel, standing before the king, addressed them as follows. O King Nebuchadnezzar, men of Athens, I notice that you are very religious in every way. Your astrologers, your soothsayers, they all been trying to give you the meaning. For as I was walking along, I saw your many shrines and one of your altars had this inscription on it to an unknown God. This God whom you worship without knowing is the one I'm telling you about. Y'all see what he did? He said, this is the one I'm telling you about. He is the God who made the world and everything in it. Since he is Lord of heaven and earth, he doesn't live in man-made temples. His purpose was for the nations. Everybody say the nations. Okay, that includes Babylon. For the nations to seek after God and perhaps feel their way towards him and find him. Though he is not far from any of us, for in him we, we live, we move, and exist. As some of your own poets have said, we are his offspring. As Paul is engaging with the people, get this. He knew their poets' writings. He knew their inscriptions on their idols. In other words, he was engaged in their culture, not just standing back and criticizing it. And in order for us to be effective... We must understand people's conditions and connect them to Christ. You have to know the people and what they believe. 
in order for you to effectively answer the mysteries that they have within their hearts. Where are they missing the mark? Why are they missing the mark? Why are they so far from God? There is something you can help them with if you would be willing to engage with them within culture. Daniel and the boys, when you read chapter one, they were picked, they were handpicked. They were brought in, and if you read it and spend a little time chewing on it, they actually spent years learning the language of the Babylonians. In other words, they were indoctrinated into the culture. They had to know who was who within society, what were the customs of the king, what were the ways that you had to conduct yourself within the temple, within Babylon, and so on and so forth. In other words, to fulfill your purpose in this world, you must be both heavenly-minded and of earthly good. Real quiet right there. Let let me say it another way. You want to be great when you worship God on Sunday and don't be awful at your job when you clock in on Monday. You need to be excellent. And whatever you do, you do it wholeheartedly. And when people see you on your job, you're not one of the other people that gossips and is just criticizing other folks around you. You ain't all messy when y'all stand around the, the, the proverbial water cooler. You're not that person. You want to know why? Because you know one day God's going to use you to influence somebody's life around you. And if they see you as just like them and there's no real change in how you walk and talk and live, then why should they listen to you when you want to talk about your Jesus and how he can change their life? If you and them are just the same and there's no difference between how you live in your heart and their heart, then what's the difference between light and darkness and why do I need your God when I already got my own philosophy on the gods that I worship? There has to be a reason, a difference between how you live and where they are. And they see something about you that's a little bit different than how you treat people. Your response to what's going on around you and how you conduct yourself. When you see your boss, they can live in such a way that disgusts you. But when you talk to them, it's still with respect, as Pastor Aaron said last week, we still can honor those who we work for without agreeing with everything that they believe in. All right. Go ahead. Be that way. Y'all can be that way if you want to. But here's what I love about Paul. He was in proximity to broken people. You can't help people that you want to detach yourself from. (laughs) You know what we don't find in the book of of Daniel? You never find an escape plan for Daniel to get out of Babylon. You notice that Daniel and the boys never got together and said, Lord, (laughs) give me an escape right out this bad boy. (laughs) God, if you can give me dreams and I can unfold mysteries, surely you can give me an underground railroad out this bad boy. Come on, Jesus. That was funny to me. (laughs) I thought it was hilarious. Instead of them running and leaving, God promotes them and put them right in the middle of the most dangerous place and yet the most effective one. God has strategically placed you in some positions of influence. Listen, be culturally relevant while firm in your convictions. Be bold. Throughout the book of Daniel, we get words like this. We get insight. And the Lord gave them understanding and the Lord gave them wisdom and the Lord gave them revelation and the Lord gave them the interpretation. The idea is that with the Holy Spirit's help, church, he gives us the keys to unlock their mysteries. He gives us light and darkness. But before you can shine brightly out there, there has to be a light that's turned on in here. Something has to happen within our hearts towards broken people. Your heart has to break for broken people. You have to care about the lost. One of the biggest problems within the church in America at large, and and, and it's our fault because we just so blessed. God put us in a land where we are prosperous. And the problem with our prosperity is we like more prosperity. And even though we got more, we're more our poor people. I know this sounds bad, but our poorest people are still wealthier than more than 50% of the world. 
We are so blessed that we don't even know it. And most of us have never left the States. So we've never seen how it is in other places around the world. I've been to some places around the world. I'm telling you, we are most blessed. And anybody else who's traveled, done a mission trip, you know. Say amen, somebody. Now, the problem with our abundance is usually we're focused on how things affect us. And what more we can get. And and God, what we're asking for that we ain't got yet. And what we forget is that life is not just about us. It's about how we can help broken people. And the moment that our hearts turn to not see Babylonians as them over there, but us and we all up in here. And we see our boss not as an enemy, but as an opportunity to connect with, to love on. And you see your coworkers or people who disagree with your lifestyle and disagree with your ways and your culture, the person, the people out there that smokes and chew and does what others do. You got more in common with them than you're letting on. Don't become that self-righteous Christian that's of no earthly good because you want to detach from what you disagree with. The goal is that God is planting you right next to him so you can influence and love on him like Jesus would if he was here in the flesh. Now, now, Babylon, I I want y'all to catch this because I ain't even got through halfway through my notes. I'm in trouble. Babylon could be translated as city of confusion. Can I give y'all a history lesson? Say yes. Yes. Babylon could be translated as city of confusion. Where did that come from? Go back to the book of Genesis. You can read it in your own time. You can read from Genesis 9 through 11 or so, where all of a sudden the people, they wanted to uh, uh, build a tower up to heaven. I think it's in 9 through 11. It's somewhere in there. Go back to Genesis. Read the first 12 chapters. It's in there. (laughs) So what happens is here's the issue with this. They wanted to listen. The people were of one language. I love how the the passage starts off like this. The people were of one language. Stay with me. Everybody say one language. language. Meaning they can say, yo, I think we all think that we should build a temple up to God. (laughs) It was called a ziggurat. A ziggurat was basically in the old days. It was a way that they would build their own man-made temple And in their minds, they believed that if they built it high enough to the heavens, that the gods lived in the heavens and they would come down like a a set of stairs and the God would come down. And next to the tower, there was a temple and then they would come in and sit within the temple. So in other words, they wanted direct access to God, but they wanted God to come to them through their own method. And on the bricks that they were building with, they inscribed their names on the bricks In other words, it was a temple where the gods would come down on what the people built for themselves and the God was subject to the people instead of the people being subject to God. And you know what God said? God said, you know what? If the people do this, they will actually accomplish what they set out to do. They're going to build this tower, but if they build it and it's a monument to themselves, it'll be to their own destruction. God says, they're going to destroy themselves, and if they destroy themselves, I can't redeem them. My plan won't be able to be fulfilled. I can't send Jesus the Messiah. So you know what he did? The Bible says that he sent a spirit of confusion, and he confused their languages. He put a mystery in the midst of the people. (laughs) He gave Nebuchadnezzar a dream. He confused the people. Somebody said, well, why would God confuse the people? It's hard to build something when y'all don't even have the same units of measurement. It's hard to build something when you can't even communicate with the other person and you're looking at them and you're trying to talk to them and they're like, I can't understand what you're saying. Second story, second story. What? They literally lost their language, and once they couldn't communicate with one another, he dispersed the people and sent them all out, and they became different nations. The nations of the world were birthed when the people came together as one to make God in their own image. God said, no, I ain't having it. You broke the first command, I'll separate all y'all in order to save you. 
So watch what happens. Oh, y'all, this is where it get good. This is where it get good. Jesus comes. One Savior who represents all the nations. At the cross, Jesus bears all of their sins. He forgives them. His blood is shed so it can cover all of them. A few days later, day of Pentecost comes. What happens on the day of Pentecost? The Holy Spirit comes in and fills the place where the disciples were awaiting his spirit. What happens when they come out and the spirit of God comes on them? It says that there were like cloven tongues of fire on their heads and they began to speak in tongues. Watch this, y'all. This is good. Imagine you in the upper room. The upper room. And you just in worship. And the Holy Spirit just hits you. He fills you. And out of all the things you do, all of a sudden you start to babble. You start to babble. Blah, 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 blah. Como esta? Hola, señorita. Blah, blah. And to yourself, you don't understand how you can speak something fluently. You walk out into the public square, and guess who's there? It's a festival. For the Feast of Pentecost, there are people who have come from all over the world in all these different languages. He brought the nations back when he redeemed them through Christ. When he saved man, not through their method, but he solved the mystery of man's heart through his method, Jesus. And after he gave Jesus, he gave the spirit. And now when the spirit comes, what does he do about what he did about the confused language? He solves the mystery. So if I was speaking in tongues and I ran into y'all and you had your own language, I didn't understand your language, but the spirit did. So I just start speaking in your language. And what happened? Those people were able to understand the mystery of the gospel in their own language. What's the point? There are a lot of people around you who need you to speak in tongues. Not literally. Maybe. (laughs) What I'm saying is you got to be able to interpret for them the gospel that's relevant to you. They're lost. And it's through your compassion that you come out of your prayer closet where the spirit comes in like a rushing mighty wind. And you figure out a way to communicate what changed your life in a way that helps to change their life. You have to do like Paul and like Daniel did. You interpret the mystery for the king. You help them come to a point to where they understand. Let me give you one more verse and then I'm going to wrap it up because I didn't skip so much of my stuff. I'm in trouble. Daniel 2, 47. Listen to what the king said. The king said to Daniel, truly, your God is the greatest of gods, the Lord over kings, a revealer of mysteries, for you have been able to reveal this secret. Imagine King Neb and all his email subscribers. And King Nebuchadnezzar, he's got people who subscribe to his text message service. And the king sends a text throughout all the land. Daniel and the boys. How about them boys? Y'all missed it. How about them cowboys? Okay, jeez. He sends this text. Truly, the God of Daniel and Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. His God is the greatest of all gods. Their king is the greatest of all kings. He tweets that out to his nation. And all of a sudden, a God of a people who was unknown to them prior to that moment, the wealthiest, most powerful nation on the face of the planet, the highest seat in government is now preaching the gospel to his people. What if we hate Nebuchadnezzar? What if we can't stand them because they have a different culture, different language, different ways, different attitudes. They don't do it the way we do it. 
Jesus died for them too. I want to challenge everybody in the room. You are Christ ambassadors. You are. You're, you're the answer. Jesus, Mary, and Joseph. The king sent out a decree. All right, this is it for real. Y'all good? The king sent out a decree and he said it like this. Ooh, if I could come sit next to y'all, I would. I would just sit next to everybody and just look you in the eyeballs and just be like, you get this? King said, if y'all don't solve my mystery, I'm killing every last one of y'all. He said, because this thing, I know this ain't, this wasn't just a pizza I ate last night. The king said, this wasn't just some random dream. This thing was real. Something's going on in my heart and I can't understand it. And it's so important to me that if y'all don't tell me not only what I dream, but also what it means, I'm taking y'all out. What is he saying? If you don't answer this, you die. Because I'm dying because I don't have the answer. What, what he's saying is literally, if we don't share the gospel, people are lost. But when we share the gospel, they come to life. But at the same time, since we give the interpretation, you get life. You are going to die. But since God gave you the answer, you get to live. You want to know why so many believers right now are spiritually dry? It's because we haven't loved on people and shared the gospel. When your walk is only about you and what you could get from your God, and it's not about what you have to give, and you don't get to experience sharing the love of Jesus Christ with other people, you begin to die as a believer spiritually because you don't know what it is to have God work in and through your life. If you've been in a place where you're spiritually like burnout, out, you just ain't feeling it. It ain't time to quit. It's time to find somebody who you can connect with and share the love of Jesus Christ with. You want revival? It's not just through singing songs. It's by sharing your story. Tell somebody, not how you walk to the front and confess some words. Tell somebody how when you believed what you believed, Something changed on the inside. What was that something? What was your life before you were saved and after Jesus has come into your life? What is the difference between you then and you now? And I'm not just talking about your behavior. I'm talking about how you see. I'm talking about what you know, what you're convicted of, what you believe about the future. The end times, he's coming back and you believe it and you expect it. And how does that hope shape your life when you lose a loved one? How does that hope shape your life when you're going through difficult times and the rest of the world is losing their minds in crisis and yet somehow you have a peace that passes all understanding that's keeping your mind and your heart in Christ Jesus? <laughs> 